Recording in progress. Morning, ma'am. Good morning. How are you? Oh, I'm fine, ma'am. What about you? I'm fine. Thank you. Okay, my dear students, before to starting lecture, I just want to advise you about sandwich revision. Do you know about the concept of sandwich revision? Whenever you are trying to, uh, you know, absorb something in your mind when you are doing study text, first read the study text, then do the understanding related to it, and then again to read the study text. You read the paragraph related to that understanding. This is called as sandwich revision. What happens to it? When you do read a paragraph, you get some know-how about the concept. Then you do understanding, you actually apply the concept. And then when you do read the paragraph again, it gets absorbed into your mind wholly and completely. Okay, especially in the case of FA and MA, do rely on sandwich revision. So once it is going to be absorbed into, into your mind like this, it is never going to be going out. Okay, so do try to follow this approach. Okay, now we are going to start with chapter number three. We have done some of the concepts of chapter number three. Today we are going to extend that, okay? We are going to start with marketing, strategic marketing process. This is a topic under marketing. We discussed about marketing mix. Do you remember the four P's of marketing? What for those? Sorry? Product, yes, then price, then place, and fourth one? Promotion. Very good. So we discussed individually all of these four marketing mixes. We had discussed about product issues. We had discussed about promotional issues. We have discussed in detail about the pricing issues as well. So today we are going to extend the same topic. We are going to discuss that, but the strategic marketing process. Whenever someone has to start the marketing process, what approach can be followed? In organizations, normally when the marketing process starts, it starts with analysis. As I told you that marketing is not just about advertising and promotional activity, it is just more than that. It starts with the analysis that what does the customer want? What are the expectations of the customer? And then we lead to the next step. And what is that? We start making the product which is going to be exactly according to the needs and demands of the customers. So over here also they are telling us that the process starts with the strategic analysis. What is a strategic analysis? A broad analysis of the market. The organizations, marketing persons are going to uh, analyze the market, internal and external involvement of the organization on the broader basis. They are going to see about the expectations of the customers. They are going to look for the competition which is present in the market. They are going to look for the competitive advantage which their organization can provide to the customers in order to lead the market. They are going to see about the brand existence and brand awareness they are going to look for. So the first step would be is going to be the strategic analysis. They are going to analyze and evaluate the market, which is uh, generally present outside the boundaries of the organization. So whatever factors are present outside, they are going to look for that. They will be looking for the political factors. They are going to look for the legal factors. They are going to look for the economical factors, social factors, socioeconomic factors. So, so many factors which are present outside the boundaries of the organization are going to be looked upon. And that is known as a strategic analysis. So especially the persons are going to look at what does the customers want from the organization? Which are the needs and requirements customers want to be fulfilled by using the product offered by the organization? So this is strategic analysis. Summarizing the fact, it is the broader analysis of the, uh, of the environment which is present outside the boundaries of the organization. Got it? Then the next step starts, it is about strategic choice. It is to see that which markets to cater. 
in which markets, in which market segments, organizations do want to market its products. They are going to, the persons related to the marketing are going to segment the market into smaller parts. They are going to make the parts on the basis of different factors, say, for example, on the basis of age, on the basis of gender, on the basis of economic position of persons, on the basis of psychology, which different persons are having around them. So strategic choice is going to be made that which part of the market is going to be focused, which part of the market is going to be segmented, focused upon, and is going to be targeted in order to market the products. So this is the second step that is strategic choice. And the third step, the strategic implementation, actually the plans of the organizations are going to be made up and will be implemented in this stage. The budgets of the organization as per the marketing rules and regulations are going to be made up and they are going to be implemented. So actually the process of marketing is going to be implemented over in this stage. All the budgets, all the forecasts are going to be actually implemented at this stage. So this is the normal process which is followed in order to follow the marketing. As they have uh, explained all of the processes in detail over here. Like over here, strategic analysis, by analyzing the market, we get to know that what are the requirements of the customers. So this process can be done with the help of a desk research, with the help of the field research, or with the help of desk marketing. What is desk research? When this research is conducted, it means that readily available information is targeted. The organizations do not go into the field by themselves in order to research something. The secondary data is going to be targeted in the case of test research. Say, for example, the information which is readily available from the government in the form of statistics. Say, for example, the information is readily available in the form of newspapers or journals or any kind of data which is already available. This is known as a test research. Organizations do not carry or do not, uh, you know, bring up their own information. They are not going to collect the data as for the primary research. They are going to cater the data which is already available. Say for example, statistics of the government or say for example, any journals, newspapers, magazines, etc. Second type of research is field research. This is dependent upon primary data. Organizations are going to jump into the market by themselves and they will be collecting the information about the expectations of the customers by themselves. Say, for example, they will be going to the market and asking the questions to the customers by themselves with the help of questionnaires, with the help of any kind of questions and answer sessions. Say, for example, seminars are going to be conducted, PR sessions are going to be conducted. So this is known as a field research. And what is the agenda of this? Again, the strategic analysis. Have a broader view about the expectations of the customers and competition which is available in the market. Then the third type of the research is test marketing. In this test marketing, the small area of uh, the overall population is going to be selected. That is having at least the same characteristics in it. It is going to be selected and test marketing approach is going to be applied. Say for example, all of the agenda is being made and how it is going to be implemented, it is going to be tested on small area first. If it is going to be succeeded over there, then overall population is going to be focused and overall population is going to be segmented and marketing is going to be done. So these three uh, types of the research can be happening in the strategic analysis phase. Then the second phase starts, that is strategic choice. In this phase, what happens? The market, the total market is segmented as per the different characteristics. As for the same characteristics, the market is going to be segmented into different areas. This can be on the base of geographic characteristics, say, for example, southern region, eastern region, western region. On the basis of areas, the market is going to be segmented. Say, for example, in overall UA, different emirates can be the geographic segmentation. And on the basis of that, then the marketing strategies are going to be implemented. This segmentation can be based upon the demographic characteristics as well. What is demography? Do you know about demography? What is demographic segmentation? Can anyone tell me? 
Rabia, Aisha, can you tell me about the demographic segmentation? You can search on your phones as well. Whenever I do ask a question, you can research on your mobile phones as well. Okay, try to absorb the concepts in this way. Be into the subject. What is a demographic? It is, it is not the uh, term which we have used for the first time. But is it the same way? Like, 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 yes, yes, same. Yes, it's the same. Wherever demography word is going to be used, it, is, it has the same meaning. Sorry? No. No, incorporated? Cooperative societies? No. Uh, I think you are you are mixing the meaning. That is democracy, democratic. This is demography. Democracy is something different. Demography is different. What is demography? I'm re relating to the structure yep. of population. Related to? Structure of population. Structure of population. Okay, structure of population into which manner? Older population. Older. Okay. Demography means segmenting the population on the basis of different characteristics like their age, like their gender, like their income. So it is again one of the sort into which in which the organizations are going to classify their market. So demographic uh, you know, segmentation is the concept which tells us that we are going to segment the market according to the different characteristics. Say, for example, Rabia is telling, as for the age, older people, younger people, and then uh, adult people, we are going to segment the market according to the different characteristics. We can segment them on the basis of their income also. Elite class, middle class, lower middle class, etc. So this is again the segmentation. So segmentation of the overall population. And Maria, do not confuse it with democracy. Democracy is as per vote when the decision is going to be taken. Demographic is uh, segmenting the market as per the different characteristics. Psychological segmentation. What is psychological segmentation? What it can be according to the thinking of people we are going to segment the market. Say, for example, older people are more sensitive. Say, for example, the young people or the adults will be more interested into entertainment. So according to the psychology of the people, according to their thinking, we are going to segment the market. And the last one is socioeconomic. What is socioeconomic? Social means social segmentation. As for the different characteristics, as for the age, as for their uh, psychology, etc. Economic means as per the money which they are having. As for the earning or as for the gross domestic product, GDP, which they are earning in whole year, we are going to classify the market. What is the income of the different individuals into different classes, we are going to segment the market. So on the basis of these four characteristics, we can market, we can segment the market, and then we are going to implement the strategies on them. And what is strategic implementation? Under this area, we are actually going to make the budgets or forecasts. As for the marketing, then how much budget we have to confine for marketing and what, how are we going to spend it? So whatever we are going to analyze, whatever we are going to make a choice for, we are then going to implement it in practical manner. Is everyone clear? So what is yes, research? Readily available information is going to be targeted. What is field research? Actual and primary data is going to be collected and the basis of that, the decisions are going to be made. Test marketing, small area is going to be selected. Out of the whole population, a sample is going to be selected and on that, marketing is going to be applied to see that how the marketing approach is going to work for the overall population. Then step into the second part, that is strategic choice. We can segment the market on the basis of different characteristics. It can be a geographic segmentation on the basis of areas, demographic one, according to the different similar characteristics in the population, psychological, according to the thinking of people, socioeconomic, social classes on the basis of the income which the persons are earning. And then in the third step, we are actually going to make the budgets for class in order to actually and practically apply the marketing strategies.
Here is understanding number 13, students. Analysis of brand strength would come under which part of the strategic planning process? Analysis. In which part is it is going to lie? A, very good, strategic analysis. When we are going to analyze the brand strength, we are going to analyze the competition. We are going to see the competitive advantage. Whatever we are going to analyze, it will be happening in the first stage that is strategic analysis. It is to get a broader overview of the market in which the marketing process has to be done. Okay, understanding number 14. My online students, Aisha, Rabi, are you cleared? Yes, ma'am. Uh, good, great. Understanding number 14, students, what is the requirement? Which of these statements relate to the functional structure? Okay, they have given us four uh, statements and they are asking that which of these statements relate to the functional structure? Okay, let's read the question. The following four statements relate to either the functional or divisional structure. So these four statements are related either to functional or to the divisional structure. And you have to select those statements which are particularly related to the functional structure. So what are those? Number one, enables access to economies of scale. Okay, if we have functional structure, is it going to give rise to the economies of scale? Yes. Very good. Why? Because same functions will be giving the services to the all of the parts of the organization. So this will be giving rise to the economies of scale. What is economy of scale? When the scale of the organization becomes larger, in work the activities are provided, we can save some of the amount then. This is economy of scale. So when same functions will be providing the services to the all of the parts of the organization, then economies of scale is going to be arising. And this is going to happen in the case of functional structure. So yes, this is the characteristic of functional structure. Second one, tends to cause duplication of roles. When we have functional structure, is it going to cause duplication of roles? Very good, excellent. It is not going to ca cause a duplication of roles. Duplication of roles will be caused in the divisional structure. Why is it so? Under divisional structure, we do have functions again then. So in every division, then there will be separately functions which are going to perform their duty. So this is the characteristic of divisional structure. So this is not going to be our option. Okay, number three, does not usually cope well with diversification. Is it so? What is diversification, students? The growth. The growth. Different people of different areas have different psychologies. That is demography. Diversification means change. When the organizations are dealing with different sort of people or with different areas or with different kind of uh, you know, psychologies, it is known as diversification. As Mariam told, it is going to be arising due to the growth of an organization. If the organization is growing, then it is going to have the operations in so many uh, areas of the uh, you know, country or the so many areas of the world, it will be diversifying. Got it? So in the case of functional structures, we do see that it does not usually cope well with the diversification because when the organizations are growing, then what we have to do? If the organizations are growing, then we should be having different functions under each and every division. So if we are having the same functional structure, obviously the functions would not be able to perform well for all of the divisions. So specialists may feel isolated. In the case of functional structure, do you think that the specialists are going to feel isolated? Why, why are they not going to feel isolated? It's in the divisional structure that the specialists are going to feel isolated. They are responsible for their own divisions only. So responsibility accounting arises in the case of divisional structures. Every manager, every specialist will be responsible for the profits of their own divisions. That is why they are going to feel isolated or separated from the overall art organization. Isolation means being separated. So this is again not the characteristic of 
functional structure, but it is the characteristic of divisional structure. So which option is the right one? One and three. three. Option B, ma'am. Option B is the right one. Everyone cleared? Yes, ma'am. Have a look at this question once again. Afa, are you clear, dear? Great. Is there any problem, dear? Okay, now, these are end of the chapter questions, my dear students. Question number 15. Conflicting demands over allocation of resources is most likely to be the disadvantage for which type of the organizational structure? My dear students, what are conflicting demands? When demands of different managers are going to coincide each other. One manager is saying different thing and the other one is saying different thing. This is the conflict. One manager is demanding something different from their subordinates and the other is demanding something different. This is the conflict of demand. Conflict of demand over allocation of resources because when the budget is made, then the resources has to be allocated among different departments. So conflicting demands over allocation of resources is most likely to be the advantage for which type of the organizational structure? Metrics. In metric structure, when there is a combination of functional and product structure, the conflicting of demands are going to arise. Got it? What is a metric structure? Combination of functional and product structure or divisional structure, whatever structure is there, we are going to have a combination with functional structure. So very good, Thizer, it's metric structure. Okay, now understanding number 16, the requirement of the question is, which of the following of mid spoke structure config configurations most closely matches P's business? Mint spoke, Henry Mint spoke told us that there are five building blocks in any organization and the sixth one has been added later. What are the five building blocks given to us by Mintzburg? Very good strategic apex, number two. Middle line, okay. Tactical management also. Operating core, then techno structure and, sorry. Ideology is the sixth one, which has been added later. The fifth one has been support staff. Very good. So they are asking that which of the following of Mintzburg structure configuration most closely matches P's business. There are four out of five given for Mintzburg structure and they are asking that to which of the component is this scenario matching. So P runs a small business making and selling garden ornaments. So it's a small business. He has identified what he states is the best and most effective method of making the ornaments and forces his staff to use this process. So it looks like that there are so many rules and regulations present. Am I right? P has also designed a number of rigid processes and that staff have to follow relating to a range of issues such as taking annual leave and recording the number of hours they work for each day. So strict rules and regulations are present. Every person is required to follow those rules and regulations. They do not have any kind of room for improvement. They will not be doing innovations in the organization. The organization will not be a creative one. So which kind of organization is it? Machine bureaucracy? What is machine bureaucracy? Techno structure is machine bureaucracy? Then what is professional bureaucracy, Saniha? Sorry? Operating core? What happens in machine bureaucracy? No, what happens in machine bureaucracy? Okay, I agree that this is related to the uh, techno structure. What happens in machine bureaucracy then? What are bureaucratic organizations? When there are so many rules and regulations involved and every person has to follow those rules and regulations, my dear students. Every person will be required to follow rules and regulations. They will not be having any kind of their own input. They will not be moving towards creativity and innovation. 
They will be required to follow the rules and regulations which are exerted by the senior management. And this is what is happening in this case. Machine bureaucracy, rules and regulations, formal rules and regulations have to be followed. Got it? What is divisionalized structure? Sorry? Middle line, in which the middle line managers are going to be responsible for each and every area under their consideration. Then missionary. And yes, entrepreneurial structure. When there will be one person controlling all of the organization, this happens in the case of small businesses. Because when the business grows, missionary structure is not possible to be implemented. And the last one, professional bureaucracy. Operating core is going to be dominating in the case of professional bureaucracy. Say for example, the persons like doctors, lawyers, accountants, operating core of the organization, which will actually be performing the duties. So this is professional bureaucracy. So the structure which P is having, it is machine bureaucracy. Got it everyone? Very good. Madhya, are you clear to you? Sure. Okay. Understanding number 17 students. Which of the following, which of the following is correct with regards to the structure of age limited? Again, a scenario is given and we are required to find that which of the following is correct in regards to the structure of age limited. So the requirements are regarding span of control and scalar change. Students, what is span of control? Very good. Span of control is the number of people which are under one manager. The number of people controlled by the certain authorities known as a span of control. If say, for example, one manager is supervising four people under it, or if one manager is having four subordinates under it, it means that the span of control that man of that manager is four. And what is scalar chain? The line of authority within the organization, the flow of authority from the higher to the lower level of management is known as a scalar chain. How many levels of management are there in the organization tends to tell us about the scalar chain. Got it students? Okay. Age Limited is a manufacturing company. The work undertaken is simple, repetitive it means. Simple meaning that each manager looks after a large number of employees. Because of this, there are relatively few levels of management within the company. So large number of employees and fewer levels of management. What does that mean? Larger number of employees to be supervised. Wide span of control, am I right? When the work is simple and repetitive, one manager can supervise a lot of people. So the span of control is going to be wider. And few levels of management means short scalar chain. Number of levels of management are few. That is why scalar chain is not large one. It is uh, narrower. Okay. So which characteristic is this right one? A, wide span of control and short scalar chain. Okay, now, understanding number 18, which of the following would be a typical feature of the flat organization? Students, flat organization is simply very much related to the uh, short scalar chain. Short scalar chain and wide span of control is the characteristic of the flat organization. Under flat organizations, the promotion is not easy. Promotional active, sorry, promotion from one level of management to the other level of management is not that much popular or not that much general because it does not happen frequently. Got it? Okay, so they ask which of the following would be a typical feature of the flat organization. Easy career progression for employees. Is it true? It is the characteristic of tall organization in which the staff in which the scalar chain is large. Close supervision of employees by managers. Is this true? Close supervision? Students, in flat organizations, the span of control is wider. When the span of control is wider, is it easy to supervise all of the employees? No. 
So there will be a supervision because the work can be simple or repetitive, but the supervisor will not be having an advantage of supervising each and every employee closely. When there is a tall organization and the span of control is lesser, then it's easy to supervise the employees in closely. Getting my point? Say, for example, if the span of control is two, the supervision is easy as compared to the span of control of five. So in flat organization, the span of control would be wider. That is why close supervision of the employees by managers is not going to be happen. Okay, faster decision making. Is it so? In flat organization, the decision making is going to be faster? Yes. Why? Few persons in the management are going to be present and when the customers are going to give any kind of expectations or demands, it will be reaching the higher authority very soon. That is why decisions are going to be quick. So this one is the characteristic of the flat organization. And the last one, high levels of bureaucracy. Is it going to be? There are going to be a lot of rules and regulations in the case of flat organization? No, because the work is very simple and repetitive. The persons will be expert in their fields and will be requiring less supervision. There will be a room for uh, innovation and creativity. So high levels of bureaucracy is the, is the characteristic of tall organization. Got it? Yes, dear. No, in the case of in the case of flat organization, what? Scalar chain will be shorter, but the span of control will be wider. The, the persons and subordinates under one manager would be broader. Got it? Scalar chain is the number of levels of management. Levels of management will be lesser, but the span of control will be wider. That's why it will be looking like a flat organization. Got it? So when there are more managers under one, First, when there are more uh, subordinates under one manager, close supervision is not going to be perfect. Got it? Everyone clear it? Online students? Yes, ma'am. Okay, great. Now, students, we are going to start with chapter number four. That is organizational culture in business. Which different factors are going to make the culture of the organization? What is culture actually? And culture of any organization is very mandatory to be understood. Why? Because this is the thing which makes the organizations growing. And this is the factor which is not, if not going to be understood, is going to make the organizations fail. So many new employees, of the organization are not able to be uh, adjusted in the organization because they are not able to understand the culture of the organization. Which different things make the culture of the organization students? The values, the beliefs of different people, the normal activities carried on by the senior management, their assumptions, what do they think, their psychology, their normal day-to-day -day activities to make the culture of the organization. One operation, if it is going to be followed on daily basis, it will become the culture of the organization. Say, for example, if the senior management come, senior management comes in time, then all of the juniors will be thinking that it has to be followed. And over the passage of time, it will then become the culture of the organization dress codes of the organization. If every person in the organization is following a proper dress code, it will then, after some time period, it will become the culture of the organization. Every person will start thinking that we have to follow this dress code, which is going on in the organization. Got it? So organizational culture in the business is having its own significance. Under this chapter, we are going to learn about the different components which make the organizational culture, like I have discussed, values, beliefs, assumptions, artifacts, are going to make the culture of the organization. We are going to discuss the influences, 
which are going to be affecting the organizational culture, which different factors affect or influence the organizational culture. We are going to discuss about the writer's view, different person's view about the organizational culture. We are going to discuss the theories presented by three management theorists in regards to the organizational culture. Now, let's start with the definition of organizational culture students. Hills and Jones define organizational culture as the specific collection of values and norms that are shared by people and groups in an organization and that control the way they interact with each other and with stakeholders outside the organization. So this is a very detailed definition provided to us by Hills and Jones. Hills and Jones are uh, you know, focusing on three major points. Number one is collection of values and norms. What are values and what are norms? Students' norms are the rules and regulations which comes into existence by following something in a repetitive manner. So norms are simply rules and regulations followed in the organization. What are values? Again, the values do have the similar meaning to the norms but values do not arise because of the strict rules and regulations. Norms do arise because of the rules and regulations followed and implemented in the organization. But values do form or do take their place by continuous following of some practice. When someone, some individuals do follow the same kind of practices in the organization over the passage of time, they become values. Norms, written things. Values by continuity or by consistency do become the part of the organization. So Hills and Jones tells us that the specific collection of values and norms that are shared by people and groups, which different persons and groups in the organization are following continuously in an organization and that control the way they interact. The values and norms will be forming a way uh, into which different individuals are interacting or behaving with each other or continuously following these practices in their departments and in their own jurisdictions with each other and with stakeholders outside the organization. So values and norms are going to give them a way to behave inside the organization and outside the organization with different stakeholders. What are stakeholder students? Stakeholders are the persons or group of persons having any kind of interest in the organization. Shareholders are one of the major stakeholders of the organization, got it? So stakeholders can be any person, receivables, payables, even government, bank authorities, taxation authorities, so hence any person having any kind of interest in the organization is known as a stakeholder. So according to Hills and Jones, what is an organizational culture? The specific collection of values and norms that are shared by people and groups in an organization and that control the way they interact with each other and with the stakeholders outside the organization. Now, Hendy defines the organizational culture in a summarized way. He says that the way we do things around here is simply known as a culture. What is a culture? As for Charles Hendy, the full name of this management theorist is Charles Hendy. Charles Hendy tells us that the way in which the things are carried on around in the organization is known as a culture. How the things are, how the operations are dealt within an organization is known as its culture. Got it? Got to know how about culture? What is a culture? Set of rules and regulations which tell the individuals that how we need to carry on the things in the organization. And it gets developed with the passage of time. When in routine, different values and different functions are performed in a similar manner, it then becomes culture of the organization. It becomes the part of the organization. Then even if the new persons are being told or not about the norms and rules, they will still be following those practices. Got it? Okay. So organizational culture has three basic components, we can say. A set of norms of behavior. What are the rules and regulations which an individual has to follow? Symbols and symbolic actions. 
when the person do perform any kind of activity, say for example, a particular dress code, or say for example, a particular badge. This is a simple or symbolic action. By performing an action, it becomes known to the other person that this is a rule. It became, becomes the part of the culture. A set of shared values and beliefs, it is dependent upon the assumptions that what do people think about the organization, about the management of the organization. So their collective beliefs and values are going to form the part of the organizational culture. So what are the three broader components of the organization? The values and beliefs, the norms, and the third thing is symbols and symbolic actions. Got it? So in short, again, the same meaning, whatever is going to be done in the organization in a routine matter, it has become the part of the organization as a culture. Now, we are explaining the three components in detail. The first one has been norms, rules and regulations. So norm guides people's behavior, suggesting what is or is not appropriate. The done thing, that is informal dress code. So in written form also, these norms are going to be addressed. These norms are going to be communicated to the different people. When any person is welcomed in the organization, when any employee is welcomed in the organization, first an orientation session is being done in which the rules and regulations about the whole organization are communicated to that new employee. So those are norms of the organization, got it? So the norm guides people behavior, suggesting what is or is not appropriate. The done thing, that is informal dress codes. The second one is symbols or symbolic actions. That is rituals, such as buying the office a cake on your birthday. So by your action, whatever is being expressed can also become the culture of the organization. Like the example which they have given, in some organizations, the informal practices go on. Say for example, there is a birthday and the employee or any other person, even the students are bringing the cake for the, for celebrating their birthday. So if it is not the normal practice, it is not the culture of the organization, every person does know what the passage of time. And those symbolic actions obviously will be coming the assumptions and beliefs of that new person also. And the third thing, shared values and beliefs, which are going to be underlying the culture by identifying what is important. That is a belief in the importance of the people as individuals. And this thing is difficult to be identified because these are related to the psychology of the individuals. There is some thinking going on in the brains of the individuals on the basis of, the, on the basis of which the symbolic actions are going to be carried on, on the basis of which the norms are going to be drafted. So these are the underlying things. The shared values and beliefs underlie the culture by identifying what is important, that is, belief in the importance of people as individuals. In some organizations, we do think by the passage of time that the people are very important. Their uh, brain, uh, you know, the what we can say, their thinking is important. The innovation and creativity which they are going to bring to the organization is important. Their inner peace is important. So in the person's culture, we can do see that there are going to be given an importance to the shared values and beliefs. So what are these basically? On the basis of beliefs, assumptions carried on by the individuals, the culture is going to be made up. Anyhow, there are three important components in the culture of the organization. Number one is norms. Number two, symbols and symbolic actions. Number three, shared values and beliefs. Got it, Mariam? Got it. Rabia, Aisha, are you clear? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Zen has to join today. New student. But he's not here. Does anyone know about Zen? Never met him? Not okay, now, which things are going to influence on the culture of the organization? Organizational culture is going to take an influence or going to take an effect from different things or different persons around. Different factors which can influence the culture of the organization are the size, size of the overall organization. 
technology being used in the organization, diversity in how many different areas the organization is dealing with, to different kind of people organization is dealing with is going to affect the culture of the organization. Age of the persons working in the organization is going to make its culture. History, what is the past practice or what are the past successes or failures of the organization is also going to influence the culture. Ownership, who are the persons owning the organization is also going to affect the culture of the organization. So the first one is size. If the size of the organization is very large, the culture of the organization can be a strict one based upon written rules and regulations, based upon some machine bureaucracy kinds of things that the organization size is very large. If the size of the organization is very large, maybe few people will be required to do the things in their own way because in large organizations, when say, for example, the tall organization is existing, the levels of management are very, very high. It means that under each person, if the span of control is lesser, then it's easy to supervise them. But if there is a tall organization and with the tall organization, we do have wider span of control, then every person would not be supervised in a much close, close supervision and they will be required to do the things as per their own thinking. So the size of the organization is going to influence the culture of the organization. Then technology, which kind of technology is used in the organization? Say for example, uh, what do you think? How the technology can affect the culture of the organization? If high technology is being used in the organization, then what will be the culture of the organizations? The persons will be lazy. If there is a lot of technology used in the organization, all of the work is done with the help of technology, then the persons who are working in the organization will be lazy. On the other hand, if the persons have to work by their own hands, they have to be work as laborers, we can say, then they will be more active. So, so the culture of the organization is dependent upon the technology or the type of the technology which is being used in the organization. If the technology which is used in the organization is updated, then every person in the organization should be having an updated knowledge as well. So the culture in the organization will become to gain extra knowledge for each and every coming day. But if the organization is using obsolete technology, then the persons will not be having an updated knowledge. Say, for example, old computers are there. They will not be having updated knowledge. They will not be getting the know-how about the new things. Diversity. If the organization is simply dealing with diverse cultures, different types of the persons are coming, different types of the uh, religions are joining the organization, then obviously the culture of the organization will be to welcome all of the cultures in the organization. If organization is not that much diverse, same and similar type of persons are coming to the organization, the persons over there will not be able to determine the you know, behavior for diverse cultures. Then age, the persons who are working in the organization are of which age? If all of the persons are young, the culture of the organization will be more energetic. If the persons who are working in the organization are older, then they will be depending upon the machine bureaucracy. They will not be having any kind of input from their own. They will be doing the practices, whatever is being taught in their whole lives. If the persons are young, the innovation and creativity in the organization would be coming. History. History of the organization also makes the culture. Whatever practices are going on from the start will become the part of the organization how the leaders of the organization tend to behave in the organization becomes the history of the organization. Whatever persons are coming new to the organization, they are following the same practices. And the last one is ownership. The ownership of the organization is in which hands? If the leader of the organization is very energetic, is going to uh, you know, have an input regarding innovation and creativity, gives regards to the views and thinking of the subordinates, that the culture of the organization will be that of the innovation and creativity. If the honor of the organization is strict, 
making every person to depend upon the formal rules and regulations, then there will not be any kind of innovation and creativity. Every person will be working as the machine. Got it? So this is how the influences on the organization culture is going to come. And this is not the end. Apart from these six sectors, there are some more influences which can be present on the organizational culture. Let's see. The first one, they are telling us the degree of individual's initiative. How every individual is entrusted to take an initiative in the organization. Look, if the persons are very lazy, they do not want to bring new practices to the organization, then the culture of the organization will be very lazy. No other new person is going to bring any kind of initiative. But if the persons are very energetic, they are in a practice to continuously bring the initiatives, bring the first steps to the organization, then the culture of the organization will be more energetic, my dear students. So the degree of the individual's initiative, is it encouraged or are the decisions always referred upwards? And if the initiative is being taken, how much regard is given to that initiative by the senior management? If the senior management is regarding the new initiatives, the four steps taken by the subordinates, then subordinates will be knowing that we will also be going to take the new steps because it is being regarded by the senior management. If they say that if they are taking any initiative and it is not regarded by the senior management, they will be demotivated and they will not be taking any new steps. So it is also going to make the culture of the organization that how much regard is given to the individual initiatives. Is the management regarding it or not? If the management is not regarding it, then the initiative is not going to be taken and taking no initiative will become the culture of the organization. The degree of risk tolerance. My dear students in organizations, in business organizations, risk is a primary factor involved. Risk of loss is a primary factor involved. In some organizations, you will see that there is a high risk tolerance. These are the organizations which do want to innovate and create. They do welcome risks. And if that kind of organization will be there, the employees of the organization will be more energetic. They will not be fearing to take new steps. But if the organization is having less risk tolerance, risk averse people are there. It means that now the subordinates are not taking any kind of risk. Organization is now stagnant at one position. Organization is not growing because when the risk is going to be taken only, then the organization can grow. So when the risk tolerance is lesser, the culture of the organization will be lesser towards innovation and creativity. When there is a higher risk individuals present, the managers do uh, regard taking the risk, the risk tolerance is high, then there will be a room for innovation and creativity. So the degree of risk tolerance, are managers only allowed to follow low risk strategies or are they allowed to take high risk strategies as well? So whatever senior managers will be doing, it will be communicated to the juniors also. Then clarity of direction. Is there a clear focus? Are there clear objectives and performance expectations? So when there are written rules and regulations present, the job descriptions for each and every person are given to their hands, then the persons do, do a box ticking activity. This is done, this is done, this is done. Outside this area, we are not required to do anything. So what is the normal uh, habit of the managers of the organization? Are there clear performance expectations, job descriptions given to the employees and they are being told that this is expected from you and this is what you have to do? Or on the other hand, only the role is being given to them, the task is being given to them, and they are given, given a liberty to follow any rule, of rule and regulation to practice that particular task. So this is also going to make the culture of the organization. The degree of integration between groups. Are different units encouraged to work together? Are management aloof or approachable? Is communication clear to lower levels staff? My dear students, in some organizations, there is a culture of cohesiveness. All of the organizational parts are integrated to each other. Cohesiveness is 
being attached, being combined with each other. There is a culture of teamwork. In some organizations, it is individualism. Every person is going to be answerable for their own tasks, for their own roles. So this is also going to make the culture of the organization that what are the requirements of the senior management? Are the individuals required to perform the task in collectivism, in, in uh, what we can say cohesiveness behavior, or they are required to work in isolation from each other and their target would be the performance of the task only. So this is also going to be the culture of the organization, the reward system. Are the individuals rewarded for succeeding? That are our rewards based on performance criteria. You need to see that whatever function is performed by you, is it going to be rewarded or not? If say, for example, the employees see that if they are taking new initiative, if they are doing something good and they are being rewarded, next time they will also be trying to do that same activity. They will also trying to be more, much more better. If after performing the task in a better manner, they see that they are not being rewarded, next time they will not be motivated to bring any kind of initiative. And hence it will become the culture of the organization not to bring any kind of new idea to the organization. Then conflict tolerance. Are employees encouraged to air grievance? Students, what are grievances? In organizations, there are grievance procedures as well. If any employee thinks that something wrong is being done to that employee, the person can communicate to the management. So conflict tolerance, are employees encouraged to air grievances? If say, for example, if an employee thinks in the organization that something wrong is being done, they are they given the authority to communicate to it to the management or not? So if the conflicts are arising, whether there is a policy to communicate it to the management or not, if this is the policy, then in the case of any kind of, you know, unhealthy activity, the employees will be encouraged to give it to the view of the senior management. If on the first time they feel that wrong things are happening to them and they are not able or they are not allowed to communicate it to the senior management, then they will be very much reluctant to communicate their issues to the senior management. Then my dear students, communication patterns. Is there a formal hierarchy or any informal network? In organizations, my dear students, formal and informal networks go hand in hand. There is a formal network which is going to come in from the organizational tree. Senior management, above to that there is strategic apex, then supervisors and then laborers. And apart from that, there is an informal network also. Cross communication is going on. Going on. Having a tea party over there, the strategic apex CEO is meeting to the laborers. Laborers are meeting to the technical managers. Technical managers are meeting to the supervisors and they are communicating. They are making friendships. So it is an informal network. So which kind of network is more persuading in the organization also makes the culture of the organization. So communication patterns, is there a formal hierarchy or any informal network? It is also going to make the culture of the organization. And sometimes you know that Managers, the strategic apex persons do know that the communication in the formal networks is not going to be absorbed easy. They do take the help of the informal networks then. They purposefully do the, you know, high teas or these kind of entertainment practices in the organization so that the communications can be done through an informal network. They can communicate to the you know, juniors or subordinates and subordinates can communicate to them so that the activities can become transparent in the organization. And then my dear students, formalization of clothing and office layout. Are there strict rules over this? And this is an artifact basically. This is what can be seen easily in the organization. By having a look at the dresses of the others, by having a look at the attitude of the others, we can come to know that what is the culture of the organization. How the people behave over the passage of time, it is going to exert a pressure on the overall culture of the organization. It will become the part of the organizational culture. And then the kind of the people employed, graduates, young, old, et cetera, is also going to influence the culture of the organization. As I told earlier also, that if there are young people or fresh graduates working in the organization, the organization will be more energetic. 
there will always be a creativity or growth or innovation or initiatives in the organization. When old people are there, then there will be a tending practice of bureaucracy. The formal rules and regulations will be adopted over there and the organization will not be having a capacity of adaptation. The change will not be brought into the organization. Got it? So my dear students, I hope that everyone is clear. Now, the last part, that is about the writers of uh, organizational culture. We are going to discuss about the views of three writers about the organizational structure. That is Scheme, Handy, also known as Charles Handy and Hofstede. We are going to discuss about the views of these three writers about the organizational culture. Have a two minutes of break before to start this. Okay, just try to revise in your mind that what we have discussed up there. Rafia, Aisha, are you cleared? Yes, ma'am. Okay. It's not working. Yes. I told you people that if you want to change the room, you can just uh, speak to the management. Okay. If you are going to address the issue only, then it is going to come to your, their side. Okay, even today, today I'm going to speak with Mr. Helen. Even you people can convey your ideas. So let us start. Three writers, about three writers input regarding organizational culture we are going to study. Scheme, Handy, and Hofstede. First, let us have a look at the concept given to us by Scheme. My dear students, Scheme gave us a view that the culture of the organization is made up by the first leaders of the organization, the persons who have let the organization for the first time makes the culture of the organization. Say, for example, the promoters in the organization, the persons who have dealt with the organization initially for the first time do make the leadership of the organization and do make the culture of the organization. Whoever is going to come the next is only going to follow the culture made up by those initial leaders. This is the concept of who scheme. So he told that first leaders of the company create its culture. Future leaders will only be selected if they support this original culture. So the persons who are going to follow the leadership strategies of the initial leaders will only be selected to lead the organization further. So according to scheme, the first leaders of the organization makes the culture of the organization. And apart from that, Whoever comes to the organization will be following the initial leadership strategy. Apart from that, Steen told that there are three levels in the organizational culture. What are those? Artifacts, espoused values, and basic assumptions and values. According to Steen, what are artifacts? This is the first level of the organization. What are artifacts? These are the things or the parts of the culture which can be seen easily. Every person sees those symbols and symbolic actions which are known as artifacts. Like I have given an example for so many times of the dress code. Say for example, the attitude of the persons. Say for example, the punctuality of the persons in the organization, the regularity of the persons in the organization. So the first level of culture, which can be seen easily as per scheme, is known as artifact. So what he says, these are the aspects of the culture that can be easily seen. That is the way that people dress. So they are not difficult to be identified. Whoever is coming new to the organization can see these things in an easy manner. 
Then the second level of the culture as per Steve is espoused values. What are espoused values? These are the strategies and goals of an organization, including company slogans. Say, for example, what organizations communicate to their individuals, to their subordinates in the form of written rules and regulations. Say, for example, the communicated aim of the organization. Say, for example, the mission statement of the organization. What organizations tend to speak with the other people also makes the culture of the organization. This is the second level in the culture of the organization. Whatever is communicated, whatever is addressed, whatever rules and regulations are maintained, whatever missions, goals are being addressed, these are espoused values. And the th third level of the culture is basic assumptions and values. These are very difficult to be identified. These two lie in the thinking of the individuals who are making the leadership of the organization or who are working in the organization. Say, for example, whenever the person does anything or whenever the person performs any action, it is based upon the underlying thinking of that individual. And that thinking is the result of some practices or the passage of time that person has dealt with different practices which has made the basic assumptions and values in the person of that particular person. So whenever the new persons join the organization, they are able to see the artifacts, they are able to see the spouse values, but what they are not able to see, this is the basic assumptions and values. What is the thinking of the persons according to which they are performing some symbolic actions or they are uh, presenting some symbols, it is unknown to them. And it takes time to get the know-how about the basic assumptions and values in the minds of the persons. So according to Steen, the three levels of the culture in the organization are artifacts, espoused values, and basic assumptions and values. So they say, Steen further commented that if leaders are to lead, it is essential that they understand the culture of the organization. In order to try and define culture, Steen described three levels. Artifacts, these are the aspects of the culture that can be easily seen. That is the way the people dress. Espoused values, these are the strategies and goals of an organization, including company slogans. Third, basic assumptions and values. These are difficult to identify as they are unseen and exist mainly at the unconscious level. So they say, new employees find the last level of culture, that is basic assumptions and values, most difficult to understand. And lack of understanding of the basic values is one of the main contributors to failure when trying to implement change. So what is going to bring or uh, you know, bring failure to the organization that is not understanding about the basic assumptions and values. What is going inside the brains of the individuals is difficult to understand. And even persons who are performing the actions on the basis of some thinking, they by themselves are not able to understand that on the basis of which thinking they are performing that action. It becomes routine. The same example, when you do typing, when you do typing, if I do ask you that where does the key C, C is present on the keyboard, it might be difficult for you to identify. But because you are practicing the typing again and again, when you are writing on the keyboard, automatically your fingers will be moving towards key C. Am I right? It happens for the persons who are typing again and again. So they themselves are not able to know that on the basis of which thinking they are performing that action. They're performing the action because the overall life practices has given the rise to that particular performance of an action. Got it? So these are difficult to be understood as per scheme. So scheme told us that the culture is going to be made up by the first leaders of the organization and the further leaders who are going to come to the organization will be selected only on the basis if they are following the practices and the culture made up by the first leaders. Apart from that, Steen told us that there are three levels in the culture of the organization. Number one, artifacts. Number two, espoused values. Number three, basic assumptions and values. Artifacts are seen, 
espoused values are missions and goals or strategies of the organization basic assumptions and values are the psychologies of the different peoples or thinking of the different people got it is everyone clear have a look at the slide once again students understanding number 1 Which of the following would not be classified by skin as an artifact? So skin told that what are artifacts which can be easily seen? Dress codes in the organization is it not an artifact by by skin? It is an artifact. Dress codes can be seen. Design of the organization's premises is it seen? Yes, it is an artifact by the uh, definition of skin. C stated aims of the organization to improve customer service very good this is not an artifact what is this espoused values the goals and aims of the organization are espoused values stated aim of the organization to improve customer service is an espoused value and the fourth one office facilities provided by the organization these can be seen this is an artifact so which is not an artifact stated aim this is espoused when mariam are you clear dear rabia are you clear yes ma'am good okay now let's move on to the next writer that is charles handy charles handy told us that there are four components of the culture or there are four types of the culture which are present in any of the organization number one is power culture number two is role culture task culture and number four is person culture charles handy denoted power culture with the god greek god zeus charles handy has denoted the power culture with the god zeus and this is the same as the entrepreneurial structure the culture is of that of the one person uh, and as an entrepreneur carrying on all the activities and having all of the orders in his or her hands so this is the power culture when one person is going to tell about all of the rules and regulations and all the other persons all the subordinates have to follow those rules and regulations so this is denoted by zeus zeus was a greek god who had or a lot of power in his hand so that is why this culture is denoted by zeus so power culture is an entrepreneurial structure in which one person owner or the manager will be having all of the authority and all the persons have to follow the rules and regulations implemented by that particular person the innovation would be lesser in the organization the initiatives will not be taken by the subordinates every person has to follow the rules and regulations provided to them by their seen role culture this is being denoted by the greek god apollo what is a role culture the organization's persons are going to you know defend their tasks defend their role by job description whatever is written in the job description they have to follow that apart from that they will not be going they will be having all of their focus on their role so in this culture there will be a dependency upon the hierarchy and status of different levels of management in the organization and they will be focusing on the job description which is provided to them what is their role it is going to be defined by the job description which is provided to them what is job description students if you have seen a job ad anywhere online if you have got a chance to see that job ad in that job ad a description is written that for this role these activities have to be performed that is a job description the you know the lines or the statements which describe the job role of a person is known as a job description so in this particular kind of an organization which which handy has denoted it as a pole role is going to be having a focus on the job description what the people are required to do will be focused on the basis of the job description provided to them then task culture this is being denoted by the goddess athena greek god athena 
in this type of a culture the focus will be upon the tasks to be completed organizational employees are going to be differentiated from each other on the basis of task which is given to them say for example in the cases of project management when the tasks are given in the on the basis of the projects project number 1 project number 2 project number a b or c so on the basis of the projects on the basis of the tasks which are given to them the organizational persons are going to be identified or their works are going to be established and this is denoted by the acronym the fourth one is persons culture this has been denoted with dionysius this is again the greek god dionysius and this has uh, you know represented the culture that is person culture in this type of the culture the focus will be upon the persons on the needs on the fulfillment of the needs and demands of the individuals who are working in the organization what are their needs and demands what their individual tasks are there in the organization it will be focused upon and this kind of the culture can be seen in the case of professional bureaucracy sometimes when the professionals are working as the operating core of the organization and their practices are important for the organization say for example accountants in the audit firm barristers in the law firm so this kind of an organization will be focusing more upon the individuals needs and demands in the organization and those persons are specifically important in the organization and this has been denoted by the god dionysius got it so there are four types of cultures as per charles handy power culture which can be denoted with zeus there can be role culture which is denoted by apollo task culture denoted by athena and person culture dionysius is everyone clear now there are two more okay so these are the four types of the cultures presented to us by handy understanding number 2 is there for the practice of handy's uh, view identify the correct statement regarding handy's cultural types from the following so four cultures have been presented to us by handy which ones are those power culture zeus role culture role culture apollo task culture athena person culture dionysius okay so they say that identify the correct statements regarding handy's cultural types from the following role cultures role cultures tend to focus on the needs of the individuals working in the organization is it true this has been rich culture person culture am i right so this one is wrong b power cultures tend to be bureaucratic organizations with large number of powerful managers is this true power cultures are bureaucratic no okay power cultures are entrepreneurial structures bureaucratic structures are task ones got it when the focus is on task so power cultures tend to be the bureaucratic organizations power cultures are entrepreneurial bureaucratic structures are tasks with large numbers of powerful managers so this is again wrong persons culture tend to develop in small highly participatory organizations when the person culture is there and there is a professional bureaucracy do you think that there will be a small organizations in which the professionals are going to participate a lot Persons cultures tend to develop in small, highly participative organizations. Suppose an audit firm. An audit firm is every accounting par accountant participating in the activities? Is every bookkeeper participating in the activities? In the law firm, is barrist are barristers participating in the activities? Yes, my dear students. so in persons culture they are going to develop in small highly participatory organizations operating core has to participate in the activities of the organization this is true and role cultures normally require staff to be flexible in order to ensure deadlines are met no 
this is the characteristic of task culture my dear students because the focus is on task to be fulfilled in role culture they are going to be performing job descriptions and in the task culture they have to be flexible in order to ensure that deadlines are met because the focus is on the task not on the role which they are required to perform so this one is again so part c is the right one is everyone clear very much clear dear have a look at this understanding once again ma'am what did you write on first statement this one is regarding person culture okay ma'am not the characteristic of role culture Okay, thank you, ma'am. The focus on the needs of the individuals will be on the person's culture. Got it? Where they have to uh, perform and participate in the organizations in every work. Okay, now students. The last management theorist is Hofstede. Actually, Hofstede has. analyzed ibm in order to identify the cultures ibm is a big organization which is having its operations in so many different countries what hoster did he selected over 100000 of ibm employees which are working in different places to see that how the culture of the organization is influencing their activities and after having a look at those 100 over 100000 employees the hof state has come to the view point that these are the different types of the culture which are found in the organization and further to this two more has been added to it got it so what we say hof state looked for national differences between over 100000 of ibms employees in different parts of the world in an attempt to find aspects of the culture that might influence business behavior so after analyzing those 100000 employees what hofstede has understood the differences among the cultures which they are having so the first one has been individualism versus collectivism in some of the employees in some of the parts of the organization he found that the focus is upon on upon the individual activities of the employees the persons are judged on the basis of their individual tasks and roles which they are performing in the organization every person is responsible for his or her own practices while in the other types of the organization he found collectivism where the persons are required to work in a team the persons are going to be judged on the basis of the team work so in some parts he found there is an individualism which made the culture of the organization in some parts he found collectivism making the culture of the organization then my dear students uncertainty avoidance index ua uncertainty avoidance my dear students what is uncertainty avoidance it is risk avoidance you can say in some of the organization host state found that risk averse persons are present where there is a high uncertainty avoidance in high uncertainty avoidance cultures the persons are risk averse they are not able to take risks whatever is given to them by their seniors they are accepting that they are not moving or they are not uh, you know taking their steps out of their comfort zones they are present in their own jurisdictions whatever given whatever is given to them by their seniors they are accepting that and they are high uncertainty avoidance cultures he also found the low uncertainty avoidance cultures also in which uncertainty avoidance it as low level so they are not avoiding the uncertainty and they are not accepting whatever is happening around they are ready to take the initiatives they are into creativity and innovations got it they do have the skepticism they have the reasoning attitude that is low uncertainty avoidance culture then power distance index that is also known as pd index power distance index is students when say for example high power distance index is there it means that the power is very much uh, you know focused in the organization 
Levels of management are very important in the organization. Management, senior management is having higher authority, whereas junior management is not, you know, given the liberty to perform outside their areas of jurisdictions. This is the high power distance index. When the power among the different individuals is segregated in a very formal manner, and the persons are not allowed to step outside their comfort zones. Whatever is being given to them, like in the case of uncertainty avoidance, they are accepting it. So what are the expectations and what is the level of acceptance for power distance? It is going to be present in this high present uh, power, the power distance index. When there is a lot of power focused in the organization, this is high power distance index. When the persons are not accepting that power distance, then it is low power distance index and every person will be working as a team. Got it? Then masculinity versus femininity. This is as per the genders. Say, for example, in Japan, there is a masculinity uh, present that gender roles are differentiated. Obviously, men are required to do the tasks which are, uh, you know, which are going to bring more strength, which requires more strength. So when there is a differentiation among the gender roles, it is known as a masculinity one. And when there is lesser differentiation among the uh, roles performed in the organization, this is femininity context. So what, say for example, in the culture of masculinity, the motivation will be brought upon by status, by more salary, by given, giving more of the power, that is going to be in the case of masculinity cultures. And in the case of femininity culture, the qualitative aspects are going to be seen. Sensitive aspects are going to be seen. The motivation can be brought in by work balance in the homework and in the uh, you know, work to be performed in the workplace, there will be a balance and the persons are going to be you know, motivated. So in the case of masculinity, because men are going to lead and the gender roles are differentiated, the motivation can be brought in by giving status by increasing salary, et cetera. Whereas if in the femininity culture, we have to bring motivation because it is more about ladies. So work-life balance is going to be given. Say, for example, rewards, say, for example, bonuses will be offered in order to pursue this culture. Got it? So these four are given to us by Austin and further two more are added. That is long-term orientation versus short-term orientation and Indulgence versus restraint. Students, long-term orientation is simply when there is a focus upon some long-term issues. It, over here in these type of the cultures, the people will be concerned about savings. They will be concerned about the long-term characteristics which are going to be coming their way in the long term. And on the other hand, there are some cultures which are focused upon short-term goals only. They will be more focused upon the salary, the monthly salary, the rewards which are going to be given to them in a the near future. They will be focusing upon the short termism only. And the last one is indulgence versus restraint. In the culture where indulgence is there, the gratification uh, upon the human needs is going to be given. The human needs are going to be having a focus upon the you know, regard will be given to the needs and individual demands. Over here in restraint ones, we are going to focus upon the norms, upon the rules and regulations. Whatever individual needs and demands are not going to be focused, but the norms, the social norms are going to be followed. Say for example, if the individuals are think that are being thought upon that they, they do need fun, they do need entertainment, we have to focus upon their needs and demands. This is an indulgence culture. If we say that, you no, know, it's fine. They are not here to have fun. They are not here to have entertainment. This is a restraint culture. Got it? So individual demands are going to be focused in indulgence culture. Whereas if the gratification is not given to the individual needs and demands, it is restraint culture. Got it, students? Now we will be doing this law. Last two understandings and then we can have a break. Understanding number four, students. Okay, this is as per your own judgment and this is basically a research one. 
So let's do it slightly. Anyhow, every one of you can have different themes. Looking at host state traits, choose the classification that most closely fits Great Britain. Because you have not researched Great Britain, that is why you are not able to classify that which of the traits will be present in the Great Britain. So as for me, as I think that in Great Britain, instead of collective one, there is an individualist approach, large power distance, small power distance will be there, and more will be masculine roles over there. In the case of Japan also, it is the same thing. So it is based upon the secondary research because you have not gone to the Great Britain to see that which type of the culture is being followed over there. So anyhow, individualistic culture is that when individual person's performance is going to be judged, they will not be judged on the basis of the team work. Large power distance or small power distance means whenever there is a large PA index, it means that there is a lot of power gap in between different levels of the management. And the power focus is based upon the power. Masculine roles that when the gender perfor roles performance is going to be differentiated. As for the gender, the roles are going to be differentiated. In feminist cultures, there will be more sensitive issues to be looked upon. Okay, now understanding number five students, the requirement of the question is, which of the following features of host state's culture dimensions are Jane staff demonstrating? So they are asking that which of the features, which of the following features of host state culture dimensions are Jane staffs demonstrating? Which of the characteristics are followed by staff of Jane? Jane has recently moved to country A, to head up a newly created research team. So there is a newly created research team. She quickly discovers that her staff seems unwilling to make major decisions for themselves. So the subordinates not able to make the decisions for themselves and expect her to monitor their work closely. So they want close supervision by Jean. The new research team has been formulated, but they are not able to take any kind of initiatives. Which kind of features they are demonstrating? Is there high individualism? No individualism, collectivism. Low power distance index is there. Low power index is not there. High power index is there. Okay. High uncertainty avoidance is there. Very good. They are avoiding uncertainty in a very high manner. And femininity is not there. More sensitive issues are not there the gender roles are not differentiated. So very good result. This is high uncertainty avoidance. So students, now we can have a break. For how much time do you need a break, students? Sorry? 11.35? Okay, fine. It's 11.07 around. So students, you can have a break. <coughs> My online students also, you can have a break. Okay, ma'am. We can join back at 11.35. Are you there? Rabia and Aisha? Yes, ma'am. Okay, are you there? Can we yes. resume class? Yes. <clears throat> okay, now students, we are going to start with the next topic that is about informal organizations. As I told you that with the formal structures in the organizations, informal networks also continue. Along with formal organizational structures, informal networks also succeed in the organization. And what is informal structure? Cross-boundary structures. Whenever there are cross-boundary communications going on, whenever there are grapevine structures going on in which there is no uh, protocol given to the formal network, it is known as an informal organization. What they say, the informal organization is the network of relationships that exist within an organization. So about formal structures, we have discussed a lot about the, you know, we have 
discussed about the different management theorists thinking about the formal structures. Now it's time to discuss about the informal organization. So what is that? The network of relationships that exist within an organization. It is not about the formal hierarchy or the formal organizational tree in the organization, but it is about the informal network in the organization, which do form by the strong relationships among the individuals in the organization on the basis of friendship, on the basis of communications, on the basis of discussion of issues, it just forms. So what are the advantages of the informal structures in the organization? Better motivation. When there are formal structures, the motivation among the employees can become lesser. Why? Because they become tired of the formal rules and regulations. If they have to communicate something, they have to follow a hierarchy in the organization. They will be communicating to their line managers. Their line managers will then be communicating to the senior management, etc. So in the informal organizations, which network, which comes along with the formal organization, there will be a better motivation among the employees. Then it can bring better communication. In the formal structures, the employees may hesitate to communicate. They may hesitate to put up their uh, issues. They will be hesitating to address their concerns. But in the informal concerns, it becomes easy for them to communicate their ideas, communicate their issues with the, any person in the informal network. Provision of social control. In the case of the informal organization, social control can be exerted. And whatever has to be brought bring into the side of the person, it can be communicated through the informal network. To say, for example, any objective is not achievable by the management with the help of the formal structures, they can bring that issue in the case of the informal organization and it can be addressed in a much better manner and the persons will be ready to achieve that particular goal. Apart from the advantages, we do have some disadvantages arising due to the formal organizations. First is inefficient organizations. The more informal networks are prevailing in the organization, the organizations do have a tendency to become more inefficient. Inefficiency means that they will not be tending to follow the rules and regulations. They will not be following the ordinary practices, which is the culture of the organization, but they do try to cross over the status. They do try to cross over their roles and responsibilities, and they do try to prevail, uh, you know, formulate the informal structures in the organization. Then opposition to change can be intensified. In the formal structures, every individual has an expectation that whatever is communicated by the senior management has to be followed. When there is an in informal community, informal structures are presenting, present in the organization, then if any change has to be uh, you know, brought up, it is not going to be accepted by the individuals on whom it has to be exerted. So opposition to change is going to be very much intense. They will not be ready to follow any kind of change because now they have become very informal in the organization. So the more the individuals are going to become more informal, the more inefficiencies are going to be brought into the organization. Got it? Then the grapevine effect, where potentially inaccurate information are rumors spread through the informal organization. You know what is a grapevine? What is a grapevine? Have you seen uh, the plant of uh, grapes? It's a kind of a vine. Have you seen it's a kind of a web? So what is happening? One branch is going like this. One branch is going like this. So many branches are creating a form of a cage, a form of a web. So this happens in the case of grapevine effect also. It happens in the case of informal organization. The rumors are going to be spread. Say for example, senior manager is telling something else to supervisor and while communication to the supervisors from the laborers, the thing is becoming changed. So this is a grapevine effect. The final communication will be having a lot of change in the meaning. So that is a grapevine effect in which the rumors have a tendency to be prevailing in the organization. Then conformity. So it is what is conformity? Confirmation to the rules and regulations which are exerted by the informal organizations are going to be prevailing instead of the formal rules and regulations. So these are the disadvantages in the informal organizations. 
even if there are disadvantages for the informal organizations, even then the organizations try to have informal networks just to increase the motivation among the employees. In every organization, together with the formal structures, we do have informal networks too. Now, here is an understanding number six, students. The requirement of the question is that which of the following statements is are correct? Number one, informal relationships are shown on organizational charts. Are informal networks shown on the organizational charts or hierarchy or organizational trees? No, never. Formal structures are shown on the organizational charts. The basic hierarchy of the organization shows the statuses and roles which are formally present in the organization. Informal networks are made by the individuals by themselves. They do not have any concern with the formal network. So this one is wrong. Second one, informal relationships within the organization can be across divisions. Is it true? Informal relationships within an organization can be across divisions. Is it true? Can they be across divisions? Why they can't be across divisions? Within one division, can... Only in one division they can be, not in the other division. What do you think, Samiha? They cannot be across divisions. What do you think, Mariam? They can be across divisions or not? So yes, they cannot be across divisions. Neither of these statements is correct. In one division, there can be informal networks, but stepping to the another division, it's very difficult. So none of these statements is correct, neither. Got it? Clear, Cesar? So inside one division, they can be stepping towards the other division, it can become difficult. So as most of the students agree, both of these statements are wrong. Got it? So neither of these statements is correct. Option D is the right one. Understanding number seven, students, which word or words best fill in the blanks? Now I will be asking you people, you have to fill in the blanks. According to scheme, there is a strong link between culture and which thing? Management style, leadership, diversity, the size of the organization. Rabia will be telling us. According to scheme, we have discussed about three management theories who gave us their views about the organizational culture, scheme, handy, and pop state. Am I right? So according to scheme, which two things do have a strong link in between them? Culture and? Rabia? Yes, ma'am. Yes, according to scheme, there is a strong link between culture and? Um, what was an idea given to us by scheme? He said that first leaders of the organization will be making the culture of the organization and those who are coming after those leaders have to follow the footsteps of the initial leaders. So leadership, ma'am? Sorry? Leadership? Very good. According to scheme, there is a strong link between culture and leadership. Got it, everyone? Okay, now understanding number eight. According to scheme, what level of culture has age company identified? So which culture has been identified in the age company in this scenario as per scheme? So scheme has given us which three levels of the culture? Artifacts, espoused values, sorry, basic assumptions and values, very good. So in the edge company, we have to determine that which of the level of the culture is being followed. Edge company is analyzing its corporate culture. It has found that many of its staff believe that the main purpose of the company is to simply earn as much profit as possible. So what they say, the main purpose. It has found that many of its staff believe. It is based upon belief. Staff believe that the main purpose of the company is to simply earn as much as profit, as much profit as possible, and therefore they are failing to provide high quality service to customers. So which one it is? Is it espoused values? 
In espoused values, we have slogans communicated. We have missions or stated aims and objectives. So this is not espoused value. Is this artifact? Artifact is what can be clearly seen. So this is not an artifact also. Is this basic assumptions and values? Yes, it is about the belief of the persons who are working in the company. So the demonstration of the scenario is more clearly related to the basic assumptions and value. And power has not been the cultural uh, level given to us by scheme. That is why it is not the answer, which is the right answer, basic assumptions and values. Rabia, Aisha, are you clear to you? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay, great. William, are you clear, dear? Okay, last students. Understanding number nine. According to Charles Handy, what type of culture does country B's army demonstrate? Students, according to Charles Handy, which four cultures have been identified? Number one, power culture, troll culture, task culture, and very good person's culture. The first culture, power culture, has been denoted by Zeus, yes. role culture by Apollo, then uh, task culture by mm -hmm. Athena, very good. And the fourth one, person's culture is by Dionysius. Okay, so these are the four cultures given to us by Charles Henry. So according to Charles Henry, what type of culture does countries we army demonstrate? So here is a scenario given to us for the V's army, V is the country maybe, and the R about the army, there is a demonstration of the scenario. So which one it is demonstrating? Let's see. Country V has a standing army of 10,000 soldiers. Each soldier has a series of closely identified duties and tasks they are expected to fulfill on regular basis. So students, it looks like a machine bureaucracy. There is defined duties and tasks. The accomplishment of these tasks is monitored by highly bureaucratic administration function. Non-compliance with the rules is punished and the soldiers are not expected to go beyond they have been set. The focus is on job description. Whatever is being told to them, they have to follow. Beyond that, they are not allowed to do so. The focus is not on the task. The focus in on, is on the rules and regulations given to them. It's a machine bureaucracy. So which kind of organization is this? Power? No. In power culture, in entrepreneurial structures, there will not be bureaucratic organizations. Machine bureaucracy will not be there. It will be power, uh, the ownership of the individual which is going to matter. So this is not power culture here. It is role culture. So it is very right. In role culture, the description of the job is going to tell us all. Got it? And what about the task culture? The focus will be on the task which has to be done by the individuals. Whatever methods they are trying to follow in order to fulfill their task, task they are going to be given a liberty for that. For power culture, entrepreneurial structure, the power which is exerted by the senior matters in these organizations and person's culture, the individual needs and demands will be focused upon. The persons will be in the operating staff, will be doing the work in the organization. Like I have given you an example of the professional bureaucracy in the person's culture. Got it, everyone? So this is the right answer, role culture. Yes, Rabia Aisha, now are you clear? This is the role culture. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. For students, normally I have seen students, so many students who do a mix power culture and bureaucratic cultures. So students in bureaucratic cultures, we have formal rules and regulations beyond which the persons cannot go. In power cultures, there is a focus on the power. Whatever is told by the senior management is going to be happening in the organization. On the written rules and regulations, there might not be a focus of them. Got it? So do not confuse whenever I have seen two, in, for two times I have seen in this class also, wherever I have taken the name of formal rules and regulations, students think that this is entrepreneurial power structure. This is not entrepreneurial structure. Got it? This is machine bureaucracy. 
Whenever there is a focus on the rules and regulations, it's a machine bureaucracy, and as per Charles Mendy, it's a role culture. Role culture is denoted by a whole. Okay, now students, we are going to start our next chapter, that is chapter number four. Information technology and information systems in business. This is a very general topic, very general chapter. And most of the things in this chapter are those which we have discussed in detail in management accounting. Students, all the subjects, first three subjects of ACC are interrelated to each other. So there are some topics which you are going to find in more than two subjects, okay? So information technology and information systems in the business, in short, IT and IS in the business. Nowadays, no organization is without the usage of information technology and information systems. They are having their own priority in the organization. The persons are not only judged on the basis of their knowledge, but on the basis of their skills and expertise to use IT and information systems. Nowadays, the work has to be performed hand in hand with the information technology and information systems. We are going to discuss that which kind of information technology, IT and IS is being used in the organizations, how the individuals use it, and what is the importance of these to the organization. So we are going to discuss in this chapter the, in the, the difference between data and information, the qualities of information, as we have discussed in our management accounting also. This is a topic which is the part of financial accounting, management accounting and BT, all three. This is covered in all these three subjects. We are going to discuss about the definition of IT and information systems and which kind of information systems are being used in the organization, types of these systems. We are going to discuss the matters related to financial technology and it's linked to the management structure, how the management of the organization will be taking an advantage of IT and IS. We are going to discuss about the software applications like databases, like accounting packages in the organization. So this is what we are going to discuss in this chapter. Now students, we are going to again start with the definition of data. What is data? Unstructured form of raw data is raw facts and figures is known as data. Whenever there are some facts and figures, figures present in front of us, but they are not giving any meaning to us, this particular form of raw facts and figures is known as a data. Like over here, they are explaining again, data consists of numbers, letters, symbols, raw facts, events and transactions which have been recorded, but not yet processed into a form that is suitable for making decisions. Whenever the managers have to make any kind of decisions, Whatever data is in front of them, they have to work on that so that that data starts giving meaning out of it. So when the process of work processing work is going to be performed on some raw facts and figures, it will then be converted to the information. Now, what can be the different types of data? Quantitative data, the data which can be expressed in the form of numbers, which can be expressed in the form of some, which can be expressed in some form which can be quantified. That is a quantitative data, say, for example, kilograms, say, for example, liters, say, for example, number of persons, number of days. This is a quantitative data. On the other hand, we have qualitative data, a kind of data which is having qualitative characteristics in it, which cannot be expressed in the form of numbers, say, for example, satisfaction of the customers, say, for example, the regard which is given to the management, say, for example, any kind of data which is not able to be quantified in numbers is known as a qualitative data. Then we have discrete data. Aisha, can you please tell me that what is a discrete data? Yes, Aisha. Yes, anyone from the class? Data which is not continuous. Very good. The data which is not continuous is discrete. So what is the data which is not continuous? Oh, oh sorry. The data which can be expressed only in the form of whole numbers is known as discrete data. Say, for example, number of persons, 
say for example, number of days we can say, the data which can be expressed only in the form of whole numbers cannot be expressed in the form of decimals is known as a discrete data. One, two, three, four, and so on is a discrete data. On the other hand, we have continuous data. This data is the kind of a data which can be expressed in the form of decimals also. Say for example, height of an individual, weight in the form of kilograms, a quantity liquid in the form of liters, this data can be expressed in the form of decimals also. This is a continuous data. Primary data is a kind of a data which is going to be collected by the person, by the inquirer, him or herself. Say, for example, questionnaires by discussing the things, uh, you know, verbally to the different individuals, this kind of data is known as a primary data. And then the last one, secondary data, the data which has been collected by someone else and analyzed by an individual for his or her tasks is known as a secondary data. Say, for example, the information collected from the newspapers, from the journals, from the magazines, from the websites is known as a secondary data. So these are the types of data, and this is just the revision of an old topic, which we had discussed in our management accounting. What is information? Information is very much clear to all of us when we are going to work, when we are going to process on the raw facts and figures so that those facts and figures start giving a meaning to us. It will become an information. Out of some particular data, if we are getting meaning, if we are understanding that what is being told to us by that particular set, it is known as an information. So simply when we are processing the raw facts and figures in such a manner that now they are understandable to us, it is now becoming an information. So they say that information is the data that has been processed in such a way that it has meaning to the person that receives it. Who, who may then use it to improve the quality of their decision making. And information is then going to be used by different persons for analysis purpose, because the managers especially have to use that particular data for the purpose of planning, decision making, and controlling. So whoever is using that particular data should be getting an understanding out of it. And which different characteristics makes an information a good one? We can learn them with the help of a mnemonic of accurate. Where A stands for accurate without any kind of errors and mistakes. Complete, having quantitative and qualitative aspects both in it. Cost, the cost of collecting the data should be lesser than the benefit which we are getting out of it. Understandable is easily getting, we are easily getting meaning out of it. We are able to understand it. Relevant, relevant to the needs of the persons who are using that particular data. Adaptable, if we want to make any changes in that particular data, we are able to do so. Sometimes we are being given the business models in which we do want to change the figures of the cost and after changing the cost, we want to see the impact in all of the data. So the figures should be adaptable easily in that particular data. If we are going to change the cost, what is the ultimate effect? It should be coming to us straight away. That is adaptable, ready for change. Time, whatever time limits are there in that particular time, the data must be, the information must be available. Easy to use, we are having easiness in order to use that particular information. If we are not having any idea about usage of the information, it is not easy for us to use, we will become, be, we will be becoming confused. So these types of the qualities should be present in an information to make it a good one. Now here is understanding number one. Students, I have completed that topic quickly because we had already discussed that in detail, okay? So understanding number one is there. Which of the above statements is are correct? Consider the following statements. Good information must be obtained cheaply. Is it true? Good information must be obtained cheaply? No deal. It must be cost effective. Cost effectiveness does not mean that it should be obtained in a cheap manner. Getting my point? It can be expensive also, but the thing is that the cost of collecting that information should always be lesser than the benefit which it is giving to the organization. It can be expensive, but it has to be compared to the benefit which it is giving. So good information is not always a cheaper information. So this one is input. Information consists of raw facts and figures, which has been recorded, but not yet processed into a useful form. Is it true? 
it is the it is again the definition of data so both the statements are wrong both the statements are wrong which of the following statements are correct neither got it everyone yes. aisha rafi are you clear yes ma'am yes ma'am okay now let's have a discussion regarding information systems and information technology my dear students it is related to the infrastructure the devices which we do have for technology is known as an information technology say for example the hardware computer monitor cpu its central processing unit the printer the mouse it is an information technology so it is basically an infrastructure or the hardware which we do have in order to carry on the activities in the organization whereas is information system is basically the brain the sensitive or the qualitative characteristics which are which are contained in that infrastructure are known as information system say for example software being installed that is sensitive information say for example databases or accounting packages which we do have inside the cpu inside the hard disk of a computer that are information systems so what they say about information systems information systems refer to the management and provision of information to support the running of the organization so there are so many information systems which are in the organization do you know for in your organization ums is being used ums do you know about ums the online portal on which you access the study text or whatever your classes are that is an information system apart from that organizations do have different management information systems which do link one department to the other department so that one is an information system and we do have so many information systems in the organization and particularly in the large large organizations in order to connect different departments we have information systems say for example why is it necessary to have information systems if one department has to communicate with the other department through you know normal communication patterns it becomes difficult to communicate if one update has to be you know developed and has to be communicated to all the organization it is just put into the information system and everyone can access that particular updated information got it so that is an information system that is a sensitive information that is uh, you know software installed in the organization so okay the information technology describes any equipment concerned with the capture storage transmission or presentation of data so whatever hardware is being used in which that software is installed is known as an information technology like i have given you example of all the hardware monitors central processing unit these are uh, hardware and known as information technology in the organization now students different types of the information systems used in the organization are these these are the normal uh, normally used information systems in the organization dps transaction processing systems mis management information systems dss decision support system eis export information system and ess uh, export system so the, this is so, sorry eis is executive information systems and ess export system so these are the softwares in uh, is in uh, organizational information softwares which are being normally used in the organization there can be more or less than this in most of the organization this management information system is present like ums is one of the kind of management information system which do attaches all the parts of the organization with each other and then addressing any kind of issue or information with the other departments can become easier got it so which kind of information systems we do have normally in the organization transaction processing systems management information system decision support system executive information system and export system so these systems we do have present in the organization let's have a look at all these systems one by one transaction processing system as its name is clarifying all that it is present in the organization to process the transactions in the organization obviously if you see in the financial accounting especially we do have the softwares which automatically process the transactions the transaction arises the business event transaction arises we do formulate it we do record it in the papers now instead of recording it in the papers we do record it in the software 
and here that particular transaction is going to be processed in order to fulfill the other uh, you know succeeding events succeeding steps so transaction processing system records all the daily transactions of the organization and summarizes them summarizes into the other step it is going to be moved on ultimately financial statements summarizes them so that they can be reported on the routine basis and whoever in the organization to whom we want to get given access to is going to get an access for those transactions and can pursue their work. So examples can include, okay, first they say that TPS are used mainly by operational managers to make basic decisions. So transaction processing the systems are nor normally not used by the persons in the strategic effects. They are being used by the persons who are present in the operating staff, operational managers or the technical managers who are given an authority to look into them will be using these systems, transaction processing systems. What can be the examples of these? Sales or marketing systems, recording sales transactions and providing details of marketing and proportional activity. So these can be the marketing, the marketing departments and the sales department. Then manufacturing production systems, recording details of the purchases. Whenever some raw material is going to be purchased, it is going to be given an entry to that particular system, it will be recorded. And every uh, eligible person is not going to be knowing about the purchases of the raw materials in the organization. Then production and shipping of goods. How many raw materials are <clears throat> processed and finished goods are produced? Why is it done so? So automatically when the raw material gets entered, a requisition, a purchase requisition is going to be aroused automatically. So this is how the software is going to be working upon. Then the persons individually do not have to look into that, how much raw materials have expired, how much is remaining. Automatically, when the raw material is going to be expired, the purchase requisition is going to be aroused. The new order is going to be given. It can be used in the finance and accounting systems, as I've given you an example, for maintenance of financial data in the organization. The invoice, when it is going to be generated, the data source is going to be arised, the entry is going to be recorded automatically, and it is going to be summarized, ultimately in the form of financial statements. Then students, the next one is management information systems. Management information systems are especially for the management of the organization, so that they can make decisions in an appropriate way. Management information systems normally collect the information from inside and outside the boundaries of the organization. The data is collected, it is converted into the information so that now the work can be done in an appropriate manner. So management information systems convert data from transaction processing systems into information for tactical managers. So managers who are present at the middle line management of the organization have to perform the task of planning, controlling and decision making so from the transaction processing system and the other sources of the data is going to be giving the information to this system so that managers can perform their tasks in an easy manner. The, this information will be designed to help them monitor performance, maintain coordination, and provide background information about the organization's operations. The MIS will be used for both historic and current analysis of the business performance as well as to use uh, to make predictions about the future performance, future operation. So this MIS management information system will be giving the liberty to the managers of the organization to make the decisions in an appropriate way. It will be collecting the data which is historic and it is going to collect the data from different sources so that the work can be done or the duties can be discharged in an appropriate way. Cleared? Everyone cleared? Yes. Okay, now decision support system. As its name is self-explanatory, decision support system will be helping the managers to support in the decisions. So it will be having such kind of information in it, which is supportive for the managers to perform their tasks. It is again going to be connected to the TPS as well as MIS. All these information systems will be interlinked to each other also students. So DSS will be having an information from transaction processing system, as well as management information system from outside the boundaries of the organization and from inside the boundaries of the organization will be information will be gathered and it will be provided in this DSS, especially again for the management to perform the task. It can be for the senior managers 
as well or for the tactical managers to support them in the decision making. So what they say, DSS is a computer system that helps decision makers to deal, deal with semi or unstructured decisions where there is a high degree of uncertainty or unknown factors that affect the decision. The DSS draws on both internal information about the organization from the TPS and external information about the market economic growth, et cetera. So from outside the boundaries of the organization, the information regarding uh, technology, the information regarding salaries of the individuals outside the organization, the information regarding competition outside the organization, the legal requirements, the political factors, all of it is going to be combined in DSS. A DSS will be tailor-made, made as per the customization, the software which is made as per the needs of the organization. So it can be a tailor-made to the requirements of the organization. And for organizations which are working on a high level, they can give their own requirements to the software houses so that they can prepare the DSS as per their own requirements. Same is the case with MIS also. They are also normally customized. Say, for example, UMS for your organization is customized. It's tailor-made. It's for your organization only. It does not have any rights for the other organizations to be using the software. Got it? Students, we have last 15 minutes. Let us just finish these last two executive information system and the export system and we are going to move forward to our exam kit then. Executive information system as its name is again telling us this is for the higher management, for the strategic apex management in the organization. It will be giving the information to the higher management of the organization to look into the future, into the long-term processes of the organization. So they say, these systems provide strategic manners, the managers, the persons who are present in the strategic effects with flexible access to the information from the entire business. This will be connected to all of the other parts, information systems of the organization. The other information systems of the organizations may not be getting an access to read all of the minutes of meeting from EIS, but EIS will be able to read all of the information from other softwares of the organization because they are being on the strategic effects. They have the right to know about all of the information which is present. So these systems provide strategic managers with flexible access to information from the entire business, as well as relevant information from external involvement. The EIS enables senior management to easily model the entire business by turning its data into useful summarized reports. This information can then easily be distributed to key staff members as for the you know, um, authority of executives in the organization. If they don't want some of the information to be distributed to the other levels of the management, they can provide it. Because if they have to address any issue through that system, they can address it. And the last one, students, it is export system. In some of the organizations, some technical knowledge is required, some professional knowledge is required. In all the levels of management in the organizations, all the persons are not specialists of all the fields. They are not expert of every field of the organization. The lawyers are expert in their own field. The accountants are expert in their own field. The teachers are expert in their own field. So every person is having the specialization in their own key area. So when some knowledge of the individual profession is required, these export systems are going to give that particular knowledge. If say, for example, the strategic Apex of the organization is thinking to start a new business, whether it is legal in the particular country or not, through the export system, they are going to be knowing from the help of the lawyers. So export systems hold specialist or export knowledge and allow non-exports to interrogate the system for information, advice, and recommended decisions. So whatever matters they have to consider, they will be asking those export systems to get a know-how about. So this is not the part of the normal hierarchy of the information systems and will be used by employees at all the levels of the organization. So this is the system which will be given a help, giving a help to all the levels of the organization without any discrimination. Anyone who wants to get any know-how about any particular area will be accessing the export system. Export systems are widely used in technical or complex areas such as law, taxation, banking, and medicine. Everyone clear?
Okay, students. Uh, what do you want? Shall we revise the exam kit and hold the remaining slides for next lecture, or shall we complete these slides and discuss the exam kit in our next lecture? Because then in our next lecture, these questions will also be included for your quiz. What do you say? Shall we complete these slides? Students, say something. What do you say? Okay, before no. to moving on, before to moving on, I just want to, because one slide is stuck in my mind, I just want to clarify. Yes, this one. In this one, we had been asked about which of the statements are correct. At this point, informal relationships within an organization can be across divisions. This is correct. In divisions, in the informal structures, across the divisions, the communication can go on. Across the hazard told that this one was correct. And all the other students were telling that this is not correct. So across the divisions also, it can go in the formal structures. In the formal, I confused it with the formal structures. In the formal structures, the communication across the organizations cannot go on. In the informal structures across the divisions, the communication can be gone because when all the divisions persons are going to be meeting together, they will be communicating with each other. Got it? So this statement is correct. And the other one, informal relationships are, this one is wrong. Got it? So please make a correction here. Everyone is clear now? My online students, are you clear about the slide? Yes, ma'am. Okay. This has been started. Okay, now students, okay, let's finish the lecture for today. We are then in the next lecture, even chapter number four, up to, up to the slides which we are going to cover. Those topics are also going to be included in the next class uh, exam, okay? Test your understanding number three. What type of information system is AFT planning on setting up? So AFT is some sort of company which is planning to set up any kind of information system. As for the scenario, which kind of information is AFT planning to set up? AFT PLC. PLC is the public limited company. Very good. AFT public limited company is considering setting up a new IT system. It needs the system to provide both internal and external information to help strategic managers monitor the performance of the entire business quickly and easily. So internal and external information for strategic managers which system is for strategic manager students executive. which one executive. executive information system we'll be collecting the information from decision support system mis tps as the internal sources of information together with these informations it will be collecting the information from external sources as well so this is very accurate it is eis executive information system so option B is the correct one. Okay, now, now students, the next topic is about software applications. What are software applications? Simply the applications which are used in the software systems, in the information systems of the organization to make the work more easier. And these are the different applications which you are aware. In your mobile phone also, you do install so many applications so that your work becomes easier or whatever you want to do, you can do with the help of those applications. So software applications are computer programs that are designed to help users with certain tasks in order to perform different tasks in an easy manner, in easy and more appropriate manner in the organization, software applications are being used. Okay, in the organization, three software applications are normally used, spreadsheets, databases, accountancy packages. These are most, uh, you know, mostly used in the organizations. There can be more applications also, but these are the normally used, uh, you know, uh, software packages in the organization or software applications in the organization. Number one is spreadsheet. Spreadsheet, we are going to look into the detail as well, students. Spreadsheet is the type of a sheet which does not allow so many changes in it, like Excel spreadsheet. So, so many 
changes are not are not allowed to be done in this kind of a spreadsheet it has to be saved at each and every step if one change is going to be made then all of the other places in which that spreadsheet is saved has to be made a changes with and then has to be saved again if in one spreadsheet we are making the change it will not be up automatically updated into the other places in which it is present so that is spreadsheet that is why it is commonly used but with its disadvantages also we have databases in order to store a lot of range of the data we use databases you know what cloud computing we do have cloud softwares also which are saving the information and we have databases also which do have all of the information related to the organization students so google drive it's a cloud computing in the cloud we are saving the information got it say for example when when i have shared the book study material with you people you were not having an access to view that that is in the cloud that we are using cloud computing over there i have given you an access and then you were able to view that particular document because that information has been saved in my database that is how databases do work so when we have a lot of information to be stored in the organization then databases can be accessed upon and it again we have a liberty to give access to some persons to it and other persons may not see it because the basic person is not giving an access to that particular document so whenever something has to be communicated it can be communicated easily with the help of the databases as well and accountancy packages in order to perform the work of accountancy these accounting packages are being used like say for example we have so many accounting packages accountancy packages like oracle got it these are these are the common accountancy packages which are used in the organization to perform the work of the financial accounting tally is now one of the most common software which is used for accountancy work in the organization so they are explaining the spreadsheets for the first time what is spreadsheet spreadsheets are designed to analyze data and sort lists of items not for long term shortage storage of raw data a spreadsheet should be used for crunching numbers and storage of single list of items students if you do bring the excel spreadsheet in your mind you can see that we whenever we have to solve different kinds of things we do use excel spreadsheets arithmetical functions are very easy to be performed with the help of those spreadsheets sorting of the data is very easy to be done if we do want to have a look at the maximum or the minimum limit we can done it, do it with the help of the spreadsheet so number crunching is very easy with the help of spreadsheet they also include graphing functions that allows for quick reporting and analysis of data if we have to present the data in the form of graphs in the form of tables in the form of bar charts etc then the spreadsheets are very helpful if any one of you does have an experience of using excel you might know by putting in the figures to the excel spreadsheet we are able to convert them into the graphs or we are able to present the data in an appropriate manner So, what are the advantages of spreadsheets? Relatively easy to use as compared to the other softwares. It is easy to be using. Require little training to be getting to get started. If anyone wants to use spreadsheets, training of that detailed manner is not required. Most data managers are familiar. Uh, most data managers are familiar with them. Most of the managers who are, uh, you know. handling the data are able to do the work with those spreadsheets so specific training is not required that much detailed training in comparison to the other accountancy packages not required over here if someone has to use oracle then they have to do a particular course in order to use oracle but if someone has to use excel that much detailed training or course is not required some persons do the courses for excel also but not on the same level as for the other accountancy packages So, what are the disadvantages? Data must be recopied over and over again to maintain in different separate files. If we have saved the data in different files, and if we are making an update in one spreadsheet, it has to be updated in all the spreadsheets individually, separately. It is not going to be updated all the places at once. 
but in the databases, if at one place we are making the changes, in all the other places it is automatically going to be updated. They are unable to efficiently identify data errors. So if we are making any kind of errors in our data, it is difficult to identify that because Excel or spreadsheet will be doing the working as per the data given to them. So we are not able to identify the mistake if we have done any, if any wrong figure is being incorporated into the spreadsheet, identify that when it becomes very difficult. Lack of detailed sorting and queuing abilities. So it gives us the basic you know, advantage of sorting the data, but in detail, if we have to do anything, detail sorting is not present in the case of spreadsheets. There can be sharing violations among users wishing to view or change data at the same time. Now, my dear students, in Excel spreadsheets, when we do share the Excel spreadsheet, sometimes we do not want to, uh, you know, others to make the changes in it. So we do not enable editing in it. So if other users want to do the changes in it, they are not, uh, they are not getting the know how to do that. Then they are often restricted to a finite number of records and can require a large, large amount of hard drive space for data storage. So for Excel, normally for spreadsheets, we do need a lot of space to store these. So the, these are the disadvantages of spreadsheets. So this is the time of the class is over. We are going to continue from the remaining slides. Only two slides are there. Shall we finish them? If I take five minutes more, shall we finish? Okay, let us finish these two. And our uh, topic is going to be over. Okay, so databases, as I told you, that in order to save the large amounts of the data, we can use these databases. To store large amounts of raw, raw data, it is best to use a database. This is especially true in circumstances where two or more users share the information. As I have given you an example of Google Drive, that is basically a database. So organizations can have their own databases as well, which are not, not, you know, not taking from the Google Drive, but they are making their own databases. But the thing is that they will be having all of the information stored in their, those databases. So what are the advantages? The most important benefit gained by using a database is the ease of reporting and sharing data. So when one person or one group of the individuals have to share the data with the others, with the help of databases, it becomes very easy. Then databases require literal no duplication of data between information tables. When spreadsheets are being used, the duplication of the data can arise. Maybe one person is doing some different calculation in one spreadsheet and when it comes close to the other person, those persons are making changes in it. But databases, in databases, we do not have a liberty to change that particular data unless, unless the main person is giving a permission to do so. So databases require little or no duplication of data between information tables. Then changes made to the data do not corrupt the programming. That is at the cell level of the spreadsheet where calculations are running. My dear students, if you use an Excel spreadsheet, you will find that in different cells, we do use formulas. If we are using wrong formula, all of the data is going to become corrupt. In all of the cells, it will be giving the value error that there is some mistake done because we do link all of these cells with each other in spreadsheet. Uh, if you are going to try Excel, then you will see over here. But in the case of databases, it cannot be the case. The data is not going to become corrupt if we are making any changes, okay? Databases offer better security to restrict users from accessing privileged information and from changing coded information in the progresses. So databases offer more security as compared to the uh, spreadsheets. In the spreadsheets, when the information is locked, that law can be broken, but in the case of databases, it cannot be. What are the disadvantages? It requires the users to learn a new system. So even if it is spreadsheet, we do say that less training is required, but the true truth is that whenever the new system is going to be implemented in the organization, the training, little bit training is being required. Then requires a greater investment in training and software in order to purchase extra space in the database, like. Even in the Google Drive, if the data exceeds a certain limit, they give you an option to pay the Google and then purchase an extra place over there, an extra storage place in their database. 
So it is going to bring up greater investment. Initial time and cost of migrating all the data into the new database system is significant. If organization is shifting the data from one database to the other, it will be requiring time and more effort. This is very normal. Is everyone clear? Okay, the last one is accountancy packages. As I've given you an example that so many different accountancy packages can be used in the organizations like Tally, even the uh, Microsoft Excel is being used like Oracle. We do have different kinds of accountancy packages used in the organization. They say many businesses choose to utilize specialized software packages that record and process the individual transactions within the business rather than relying on manual reports. So instead of recording the transactions manually, they do purchase those accountancy packages and do input the transactions into them. And automatically those softwares, those accountancy packages lead to the financial statements. So when you will be becoming chartered accountant, even before to that, when you will start working, you will see that all of the work of recording, classifying and summarizing the transaction is done with the help of the softwares. You have to put in only the initial transaction. You have to record the initial transaction only and then ultimately it will be bringing you the reports, financial reports by itself. These accountancy accounting packages are often designed to automatically produce year-end accounts, financial statements, and management reports when requested. So after putting in the initial information, whatever reports you are requiring from those accountancy packages are going to be given to you. What are the advantages? Rapid recording of transactions when compared to the manual system. Manually, whenever the work is done, it will be slow in speed. With the help of these accountancy packages, the speed will be higher. Lower likelihood of mistakes. Obviously, with the help of IT and with the help of IES, the mistakes will be lesser. Rapid production of reports and financial statements. Rapidly, without any extra effort, without any number crunching, the financial statements will be produced ultimately in the form of reports. What can be the disadvantages? Usually requires training before use. Say, for example, the difficult accounting softwares do require special courses before to their usage. Packages can be expensive to purchase and install. Some customized softwares are very expensive to be purchased and to be installed in the organization. That is why the small organizations do rely on the free accountancy packages. Then maybe unnecessary for a small business with low numbers of transactions. So small businesses do not require these much of complex software packages, accountancy packages. Now, students, there is a last understanding for today. Which of the following is not an advantage that databases have over spreadsheets? A, less training required. Is it an advantage that databases have over spreadsheets? It's not an advantage. Less training is required. In which case less training is required? In the case of databases or in the case of spreadsheets? In the case of spreadsheets, less training is required. True. Better security. In which case better security is required? Uh, be better security is present in the case of databases or spreadsheets? Databases, very good. Less duplication of information. In case of in case of databases, less duplication is present. Greater ease of sharing information. Databases. So which one is our option? Option A, less training is required. It's not an advantage of databases over to the spreadsheets. In case of databases, we do need more training as compared to the spreadsheets. So my dear students, this is all for today. Unfortunately, we are not able to put on the quiz today. What we are going to do in our next lecture, in the start of the lecture, we are going to hold a quiz first. In that particular quiz, we are going to have the uh, exam kit questions from chapter number one, two, three, and chapter number four up to the task which we have completed today. Okay, clear? Sure, thank you. So Miha is very tired. Okay, okay, so yes, thank you so much for attending the lecture. I brought the exam paper, unfortunately, we were not able to do that. Anyhow, in the next lecture, we will be doing that. Okay? Allah, please, ma'am. Allah, please. Have a nice day. Thank you, ma'am. Bye-bye.